My name is Martina Cole. I'm a crime author. The nature of true crime often defies understanding or logic. And in my opinion, the most difficult perpetrators of crime to work out are the women that murder time and time again. In this series, I'll be shining a light on six of the most prolific female mass murders in history. So welcome to the dark world of the lady killers. Former nurse Beverly Allett begins a sentence without end tonight for murdering four children in her care and for injuring nine others. She was given life 13 times over and was told there was no real chance of her ever being free again. This is the story of lady killer nurse Beverly Allett. In 1991, she murdered four children and attempted to murder at least another nine. These incidents took place over 61 days at the little cottage hospital she worked at in Grantham in Lincolnshire. In 1993, Alec was sentenced to 13 life sentences for her crimes. She is currently serving her time at a secure hospital, rather than a prison. Detained under the Mental Health Act, Alec repeatedly self-harmed, and it was thought this might be symptomatic of a condition known as Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Beverly Alec's killing spree began when she was a 23-year-old nurse. When the horrendous details of her crimes were revealed during her four months trial in 1993, the country was shocked and outraged that such a hideous crime could not only happen, but had been allowed to happen. When she was arrested, it was complete shock and disbelief. I just could not believe how could ever a nurse working with me had carried out all those heinous crimes. She utilised a system at the time which didn't have sufficient checks and measurements. We'd seen a, a, a picture of, of a young woman that manipulated people around her, boyfriends, friends, other nurses. But the one central thing was that here was somebody that needed to be the centre of attention. She had actually targeted and highlighted the children that she was supposed to be caring. And she had the uh, re respect to the families, she was uh, undermining their confidence and their loyalty to her. Uh, um, I think she's an absolutely evil person. I don't think healthcare professionals become killers. I think killers can become healthcare professionals who f use the situation to actually target victims or carry out whatever their own fantasies or ideas were. We have never ever heard a nurse ever killing or harming any child in United Kingdom till then. These crimes are almost impossible to conceive. A nurse killing the children she is supposed to care for. The newspapers quickly dubbed Alec the Angel of Death. The term Angel of Death, it wasn't something that had been mentioned a lot. It wasn't, wasn't a term I was, I was aware of before the Beverly Alec case. We've certainly heard it many, many times since then. Angel of death is a term that uh, many prefer in the uh, criminology trade for doctors and nurses and perhaps a few other hospital type employees who kill patients one after the other, uh, usually by poisoning. But the angel part is because she posed, if you like, as a nurse and did it from the position of a responsible medical person who's supposed to be looking after these children. So instead of an angel of mercy, she was an angel of death. She appeared to have a relatively normal background, one of four children to Richard and Lillian Allett, who lived in Corby Glen, just outside Grantham in Lincolnshire. Corby Glen is like any other rural town really. Before the early 90s it was known as you know Margaret Thatcher's home you know she'd only just finished being Prime Minister a couple of years before if you like. It could be any village anywhere in, in rural England. Very quiet, um, people certainly not used to this kind of media attention. 
So what was it that set this seemingly unremarkable girl on a murderous path? As a child, there were signs that something wasn't quite right with Beverly. She had a habit of making up stories and of lying to people. She made frequent visits to her GP for various illnesses and was often seen sporting injuries. What made her change from a normal child to a child killer? I think in the specific case of Beverly Allen, we can almost certainly suppose that she did have some illness, no matter how minor or serious, uh, which received attention. And from that day on, I think she would slowly but surely start to manufacture illnesses to maintain that level of attention. Beverly Allen. There were incidents where, as a schoolgirl, she'd gone to visit the doctor and she came out with bandages and slings. She told stories that were not necessarily true about her upbringing. For example, she, she told people that she'd uh, um, been brought up in a household where mum and dad had split and that she'd had to go to live with an aunt down in either Devon or Cornwall. And there were many, many examples of Beverly stories which, when investigated, were not necessarily true. In her last two years at school, Alice studied child development and started to take an interest in nursing. With four CSEs and an O-level in food and nutrition, she signed up for a pre-nursing course at Grantham College. A year later, she started her training as a state-enrolled nurse. In 1991, Beverly Allett had managed to get herself employed as a nurse in Grantham Hospital, having had a lot of difficulty in the past of actually getting academic qualifications to go on courses. But she was lucky she managed to get this job where there were issues with understaffing, where there was problems in organisation and so on. And she used the whole care situation to her own ends. As a student nurse, Beverly Elliott was off sick for 126 days during her last year of training with a litany of ailments. Despite this flaky record and her obvious tendency towards hypochondria, Trent Regional Health Authority was short-staffed enough to recruit Elliott as a nurse on February the 15th, 1991. Ward 4 looked after sick children and babies from a range of ages. Most children came in with minor illnesses and were quickly treated and sent home as soon as they were well enough. The two consultants, Drs Porter and Nanny Cara, and all the staff tried to make Ward 4 a warm and welcoming place. It was a relatively small district general hospital. Beverly Allett was appointed new. To my understanding, Beverly Allett was no different to many other nurses. She presented as indeed this very caring, happy little person who appeared with every family saying, I'm looking after your child, I'm caring for that. So there was this kind of possibly an unusual positive approach to life. Initially, the parents felt that she was an angel, if you like. The nurses had respected her uh, because it was her that identified problems. And she called the alarm on a number of these children. And she actually escorted them to the Queen's Medical Centre in the ambulance. So uh, uh, she was held in high esteem on the ward at this time. Although Ward 4 was understaffed and under-resourced, everyone, including new recruit Beverly Allett, pulled together to make it a friendly environment for the children. At this point, no one had any suspicions about the evil acts Beverly Allett was about to commit. Beverly Allett now employed as a nurse on the children's ward at Grantham and Kesvin Hospital, is in her element. She's had an interest in nursing since her school days, and she seems to fit right in on Ward 4. Given her sketchy track record as a student nurse, it amazes me how she could ever have been employed by the NHS. In February 1991, just one week after Beverly Allett started on Ward 4, strange things started to happen. Money was being stolen from the nurses' bags and a key to the insulin fridge went missing. But more importantly, some of the children were experiencing near-fatal collapses, heart attacks, breathing difficulties, organ failures. And some of the children started dying. Doctors Nani Akara and Porter were beginning to have grave concerns about events on Ward 4, concerns mirrored by the staff at nearby Queen's Medical Centre. For one child a year to die at the larger Queen's Medical Centre was the average, 
So for four children to die over a 61 day period at the little cottage hospital of Grantham and Kespen was staggering. The head of paediatric at Queen's Medical Centre insisted that doctors Nani Akara and Porter calling the police. The police had no idea what they were about to uncover. So I went in the hospital and I saw Dr. Nanyakara, Dr. Porter and Mrs. O'Nions. Um, and I then had revealed to me uh, aspects of a number of incidents which had occurred with young children at the hospital over a period of weeks. On the, the last day of April of 1991, I was finishing another murder inquiry and I received a call from a detective sergeant at Grantham who in, in turn had been contacted by the hospital authorities. That suggested that there may be some difficulties on the children's ward at Grantham Hospital. It wasn't known whether the responsibility lay with staff or with parents or with support staff. So on Friday the 3rd of May I went to a meeting in the administrator's office at Grantham Hospital. There were representatives of the regional health authority, there were press officers for the health authority, there were police press officers. Myself, two paediatricians who worked on the children's ward, Dr. Porter and Dr. Nanyakara. At that meeting, Dr. Porter presented a case that suggested that perhaps 12, 13 or maybe even 14 children had suffered multiple collapses and he felt that it was at the hand of somebody that wished harm to children. I asked at that meeting the expert that had been nominated, David Hull, to take away the case files of, of these children and send me a report. It was agreed by Stuart, who was the head of the operational CID for the county, that we'd have to set up a, a major inquiry team. The report came back and confirmed the suspicions of the investigating team. The police realised they had a major murder case on their hands. A few days into the inquiry, I decided that I ought to visit the children's ward at Grantham Hospital, Ward 4. I was first surprised that I was able to visit that ward without any challenge, that I was able to walk around it without somebody saying, what are you doing, who are you? And when I eventually addressed the staff there, I was equally surprised to find the level of resentment that there appeared to be and um, the police were actually involved. The police during the investigations were certainly a nuisance to us, if I may use that term, because we were carrying on with our normal day-to-day -day service needs, providing the total care, but the police visited the hospital virtually 24 hours a day as part of the investigations, not knowing whether there had been any culprit amongst us. So it was quite obstructive and sometimes was frightening. Well, there had been four children die over this eight or nine week period and, and one of the disturbing facts was they would expect one child probably to die a year at the Queen's Medical Centre. And this was a little regional hospital and there had been four deaths in about eight or nine weeks and there had been, I think, a total of 23 respiratory or cardiac attacks. The nurses themselves, they do sign an oath of confidentiality. They didn't really talk to each other. They certainly all felt they were to blame, and so I think they probably felt they were suspects. The report highlighted one incident worthy of deeper investigation. It was the case of a five-month-old baby boy called Paul Crampton, who'd been admitted with a severe chest infection. During his stay on Ward 4, he suffered three unexplained collapses. On the Saturday, which was the 23rd of March, he had his first collapse. That collapse was brought to notice by Beverly Allett, who was within his room within the ward and called one of the other nurses and indicated that this little boy, Crampton, was suffering breathing difficulties and sweating profusely. I found he was very shut down, circulation being extremely poor, the peripheries are cold and clammy. 
And having quickly asked what happened from the nursing staff and the parents who were there at the time, I could not identify any specific medical reason to account for this collapse. For reasons known only to her, Alec makes the unusual suggestion to test for hypoglycemia, a check for low blood sugar levels. This test proves positive and Paul is treated successfully and makes a full recovery. On Sunday, I came again and did a ward round. I saw Paul, along with all the other children under my care. Again, Paul remained well. All the observations were pretty normal and stable, and I was quite happy. Beverly Allett was required to take down the drip because by this time the child had recovered. And almost immediately, the child went into regression and doctors had to be called again and he had a second of, of these attacks. We managed to keep him alive and I expressed my great concerns and the parents were extremely anxious and worried. But he became stable. The following three days were almost uneventful and Doctors were on the point of, of sending him home. David Crampton had been keeping an eye on his little son. When he felt that he was over the worst, he decided to leave the ward for a short break. When he returned, about a half an hour later, he saw his child sweating profusely, having difficulty breathing, and was turning blue. He called, called the, um, the doctors and, and nurses on the ward, and the child was given appropriate treatment, then transferred to the Queen's Medical Centre at Nottingham, where he recovered spontaneously. After the third collapse and prior to his transfer to Queen's Medical Centre for specialist care, a blood sample was taken from Paul to try and clarify the reason for his medical reactions. Weeks later, when the results finally came back, it showed that Paul's insulin levels were off the chart. They had a few samples available that we could measure the insulin level in. And when we got the results, at least of some of them, we were stupefied. There was only one other case in all the medical literature anywhere near as high, and that was in somebody who'd been uh, given a huge dose of insulin and subsequently died. We knew that this was very, very uh, unusual. So from this point on, I think, as an inquiry team, we were pretty much aware that we had a murderer or a potential murderer on the ward, despite the fact that this, ch this child had, had recovered. Four babies died in the children's ward. Eight others suffered cardiac or respiratory attacks. A nurse has been on extended leave as a result of police discovered abnormally high levels of the drug insulin in several children. We first heard about events on, on Ward 4 shortly after the police had been, been called in. There was, it was clear there was a lot of police activity going on at the hospital, but nobody was saying exactly what was happening. But there was a lot of rumours starting. Uh, clearly, you know, the police were talking to so many people. There was the staff at the hospital. There was the, the parents' concern. There was uh, other people who were at the hospital on, on the nights uh, in question. They were knocking on doors. People could see something was going on, but we weren't quite clear what. There are certain aspects of the case that have been investigated already which lead me to believe that some of the incidents at the hospital are suspicious. The most parents whose children... Some of them were harmed and some of them died under my care. Were very anxious, angry, worried as to what happened. At first, the parents weren't even themselves told exactly what was happening. Um, you know, they knew there was an investigation at the hospital. They didn't realise that there was uh, more than one child being investigated. Rightly so, the police were, were being very careful. You know, the police themselves weren't exactly sure what they were facing at the time, certainly no motive um, for, for any of the, the killings or the harming that, that had gone on there. Well, I was shocked, very shocked, and I just felt numb. I just couldn't believe that such a thing could happen. I mean, I put my child in the safest place possible. And when I heard that, that happened, I just, I just couldn't take it in at first. And eventually, um, somebody, whether it was in the police or, or the hospital, did leak that a nurse was being investigated and that uh, children may well be involved. And that really then, it, it just exploded. 
The police now know they have a serial killer on Ward 4, but they have absolutely no idea who it might be. It could be a member of the medical staff, the public, other hospital workers. It could be almost anyone. In an attempt to narrow down the field of suspects, a surveillance camera is set up at the entrance of Ward 4. I extended the enquiry to cover all of the children that had been referred. There was something like 24 or 25 collapses involving 12 or 13 children. And we decided that we would chart these and chart who was on duty. One of the constables was tasked with putting the instance on with the patients down the side and then the nurses along the top. It became apparent during that that Miss Allard stood out as being either a person who had tended to the child before an incident occurred or had found the child as the incident happened. We knew then who had done it. There was no doubt in our minds who had committed this crime. She was the only one present. She was the only one with the opportunity. Three weeks into the inquiry on the 21st of, of May, I decided that I would have her arrested. And when we searched her house, we'd actually found the ward allocation book, which is the little book that uh, identifies which child is being specialed on which ward and which nurse is present, and that was in her wardrobe. And there was, the, particularly with Paul Crampton, there was uh, pages that had been removed and obviously taken out by her. I think the media in, in Lincolnshire had never seen anything, anything like it. You know, very rarely does this kind of thing, thank goodness, happen. Um, but suddenly, you know, you, you, one day it's very quiet, Grantham, a nice little rural market town. The next day, you had dozens of reporters, you had long lens cameras, you had satellite trucks, you had the TV crews, radio reporters, obviously, the newspaper guys, all there. Um, and, and they would speak to anybody who moved. You know, they, they wanted the story. Under this intense media scrutiny, 23-year-old Beverly Allett is escorted to Grantham Police Station for questioning. I interviewed her over 17 hours, two days, um, after each file, and frankly, she didn't admit to anything. She was a strange girl in that she showed no fear of the situation that she found herself in. She proffered that she was trying to be helpful and she tried to distance herself from each of the collapses. By that I mean to say that she would say things like, well, I wasn't there, I only came on the scene later, I wasn't even there that day. Without enough evidence to charge Alec, reluctantly the police had to let her go, pending further investigation. She was released on bail on the 23rd of May, 1991. With increasing press interest, Alec is forced to leave her home and move in with her girlfriend's family in nearby Peterborough. The hospital, following recommendation by the police after the initial investigations, recommended that she should be suspended from the hospital and therefore she did not come back to the hospital to work with us anymore. The case of a, a nurse killing children, there hadn't been any in the UK, so people refused to believe that that was what Ali had done. At the same time, of course, they were trying to come to terms with the accusations that were being made against a friend of theirs, someone who lived in the village. No one would believe, even the parents concerned, that she had done what a lot of people seemed to be saying she had done. At this point, an hour out on bail, Beverly Elliott must think she's got away with murder. She believes she's fooled the police, her colleagues, her friends and her family and even the families of the children involved in the investigation. Especially Mr. and Mrs. Phillips, parents of twin girls, Becky and Katie. They had already lost one child, Becky, who was only two months old. But Alex's powers of manipulation and levels of deceit were such that they made a godmother to their remaining child, Katie. The Phillips, so wholly convinced by Alex's caring nurse act, even go so far as to hire a private detective to try and prove her innocence. With insufficient evidence to charge her, Beverly Elliott was eventually released on police bail on the 23rd of May, 1991. Back in her community, Elliott appears unfazed by this turn of events and insists she's innocent of the crimes laid against her. But behind this facade, 
was an opportunistic, devious and self-obsessed individual who preyed upon people's fragile emotions. The way she went about providing herself with the opportunity was to cultivate um, close friendships with the parents um, and to provide herself with an opportunity by sending the parents down to the canteen for a coffee while she looked after their child. And in fact, looking back on it, many of the parents said to me that they actually really appreciated the friendship because it was lovely that it was a paediatric ward and the nurse came across to them as being very caring. The Phillips allowed Alec to, to not only be godmother to, to one of the twins, but also to babysit, even while that investigation was ongoing. She really did seem to have some hold over the local community. As the investigations continued, it was now becoming clear to the police that Alec was creating diversions to have sole access to a young and defenceless victims. The police concentrated on the Phillips twins and what they believed to be Alec's involvement in one of their deaths. Becky was admitted to hospital for nothing more than vomiting. She was treated over the course of two or three days. They managed to, um, to control the vomiting and she was ready for release from from hospital. And she met Nurse Allett and she was nursed by Allett before she went home. When she got home she was clammy, she was sticky, she was irritable and her condition got worse. Eventually I think the ambulance was called or her father took her into hospital where she died. Um, as a result of that Katie was brought into the ward and Katie was a well child, a twin sister, so there's nothing wrong with Katie. Because of this unexplained death on Becky, I persuaded the parents to admit her for observation in case she gets into some difficulties so that we were able to provide necessary investigations and the care. With reluctance, the parents agreed to accept my advice, which I very much regret now. She suffers three separate collapses. The first of them, Beverly Allett is allocated her care and it's noted by another nurse that the cot has t been turned through 90 degrees. This has the effect of making it very difficult to see what's occurring with the child. And it's Beverly that raises the alarm when she, she calls the crash team and, and says that this is a child that has stopped breathing. The crash team managed to resuscitate but not before she's allocated her care twice more and twice more have similar events occur. Now on this particular child, Beverly has got rid of staff that's surrounding her by asking them to do particular tasks so that she's left alone with, with the child. When x-rays are later examined of this child, she's got broken ribs. Inevitably, details of the Alec case were being picked up by the press. There was a lot of pressure on, on the parents, on Alec's friends, on staff at the hospital to, to tell their story. The whole area was, was covered in journalists trying to speak to anybody, everybody, who uh, had any association with Alec whatsoever. And I think that the pressure was increasing more and more. I could see my world falling apart around me and just couldn't do anything about it. I just felt totally hopeless and helpless. Well at first I didn't believe what they were saying, what the, what the police were saying because I didn't think she could do such a thing to anybody. In fact I, I said at the time I can't believe anybody around that hospital would do such a thing. Well the journalists were turning up on their doorsteps and were offering them the moon um, because of course it was a completely novel thing, um, you know, a, a healthcare practitioner um, harming people and particularly young children. It's now two months since her first arrest and Beverly Alley is still hiding out with her girlfriend's family in Peterborough. Meanwhile, as the press reveal more and more details about Alex's activities on Ward 4, the parents begin to feel real fear and to wonder if their trusted friend, Nurse Bev, could really be responsible for killing and harming their children. What that woman's done is unbelievable. It's too horrific. It really is. There's no feeling of forgiveness. No, never. Never forgive that woman for what she's done. Never. No way. Meanwhile, the police continued their investigations back in Grantham. It was taking a long time to collect all the evidence, 
Ali hadn't just used one method to murder and injure her victims. She'd used a variety of approaches. Then, at the beginning of July 1991, the police finally had a breakthrough. I visited the city hospital at Nottingham. There was a freezer, a chest freezer. It was absolutely full of these little pops. I actually recovered blood from nine of the ch 13 children that had been attacked. Now, once I'd got those samples and got them back, uh, obviously, to the police station, number one, the superintendent didn't know if we had the resources to have all those samples examined. The second thing was, what did we examine them for? Insulin was used in two children. There had been injection of air and possible toxic substances, suffocation. It's only circumstantial evidence. There was no eyewitness account. So it's only having collected all the information over many months that they found that Beverly Allen may have carried out different actions to harm and kill these children. The police investigations now left no doubt that a state-enrolled nurse employed by the NHS at Grantham Hospital was involved in these crimes. On the 26th of July, DS Stuart Clifton was ready to make the arrest of Nurse Beverly Allen. The political implications were huge. The Secretary of State insisted that the Director of Public Prosecutions review the entire Alec case. That rather surprised me because this was not the type of offence that I would have expected that, that, that he'd asked for a file. But I think that there were many political elements that were working at, at this particular time. And the, the party of the day being able to prepare for the backlash that may have come as a result of it. During the ensuing delay of three months, while the director of public prosecutions examined the files, the parents were getting increasingly frustrated by the lack of progress. They decided to take matters in their own hands and called a press conference on the 10th of October, 1991. Well, I speak for everybody when I say this, that we just all want some kind of decision making, and very quickly, because um, none of us wants to go through this any longer. We, we've, I think we've, we've all suffered enough. The main purpose of the press conference was to give the parents an opportunity to say uh, what they felt about what was going on and to try and bring some pressure um, on the police to make a decision as to whether or not they were going to go ahead and actually charge Beverly Allett with a crime. On the 20th of November 1991, six months after the start of the murder investigation, the Director of Public Prosecutions was finally satisfied and advised the police to proceed with the arrest of Beverly Allett. She was charged with 15 offences, including four counts of murder, five counts of attempted murder, and six counts of grievous bodily harm. She was a young lady in her early 20s that showed no fear, which really surprised me. She's charged with these offences. She goes into a police cell. She lays her head down and has to be woken the next morning for court which I found rather amazing that, I mean, if, if I'd have been in that situation, I don't think I'd have slept a wink, but, but here's a young woman that didn't seem to take in the enormousness of, of what was happening to her. The fact that Beverly Allen quite simply fell asleep shows basically that she was a manipulative, psychopathic individual because that is probably the most efficient thing you can do. To sit there agitated, depressed or worrying about your situation, that would be too human for her. Beverly Allett went on trial at Nottingham Crown Court on the 15th of February 1993. She was charged with four counts of murder, five counts of attempted murder and six counts of grievous bodily harm. It was almost with relief, I think, we're, that we're finally coming to the presentation of the evidence and, and for a jury uh, to make a decision. It was only after she was charged that crowds did start uh, appearing outside the court and, and that then, you know, there was the, the usual scenes of people jeering as the prison van was, was arriving, was departing. People began to realise there is more to this story than meets the eye. It was then, really, that, not necessarily a witch hunt, but certainly that, that, that people started uh, feeling frustrated and angry towards her. During the trial, 
journalist started to delve into Alex's background. It seems she regularly feigned illness as a child, constantly seeking her doctor's attention. As a student nurse, she was absent from her training course for over 100 days. It seems that Alex and sickness went hand in hand, and this pattern continued even during her trial. There were huge gaps when she didn't appear, and we were not party, or I was not party to to why she didn't appear. But we heard through through leaks from the prison service that that she was ill, and I've no doubt that this was yet just another one of Beverly Allen's foibles, and she was ill because she wanted to be ill. She would probably try to stay out of the courtroom almost 100% of the time. The fact they actually got her there under those circumstances was probably something of a miracle. And I don't think it was a case of um, she wanted attention of that type. She wanted positive attention. She wanted to be seen as a victim, a poorly, sickly person who's been wrongly accused in prison. That is the role she wanted to portray, not a guilty person in the dock. As the trial went on, there was little doubt that Alec had committed the crimes. But the evidence presented was purely circumstantial. There were no eyewitnesses, no fingerprints. And as the survivors were so young, they were unable to speak for themselves. The investigating officers started to have concerns. The difficulty was, uh, obviously, we had no positive information on individual children. She was never seen with a syringe in her hand. She was never seen holding somebody's nose. I was obviously anxious during the trial. It had taken nine months of my working life. Um, and, and I was convinced in my own mind that we had prepared a good case against Beverly Allett. So I was fairly confident that we'd put a case together, but one can never be sure with juries just how they're going to react. The police were nervous, but with no hard evidence, everything was circumstantial. There was no smoking gun. It had taken nine months of intense investigation to bring Alex to trial. The decision now lay in the hands of 12 members of the public to decide on Beverly Allett's guilt or innocence. The jury were out for six days, poring over the minute details of the case. And what a dilemma for them. There were no eyewitness accounts, no background information on Alex's past behavior. They were hearing about crimes no one ever thought possible. And all these accusations about a nurse someone entrusted with the care of our children. Finally, on the 17th of May, 1993, the jury returned with the majority verdict. Although two counts of attempted murder were rejected, Beverly Elliott was found guilty of grievous bodily harm and attempted murder to Henry Chan, Christopher Peasgood, Patrick Elstone, Katie Phillips, Michael Davidson, Christopher King, Bradley Gibson, Paul Crampton, and Kaylee Desmond. And Beverly Elliott was found guilty of four murders. Timothy Hardwick, Becky Phillips, Liam Taylor, and Claire Peck. When the jury returned with their first gu guilty verdict, so I, I think it's fair to say there was a sense of relief that ran over me. And the parents felt the same. There were tears in the, in the, in the gallery from parents and, and you, you can't live with that situation for 13 weeks as we'd done during the trial and it not affect you. And it was sent to Holloway Prison to await sentencing. After a series of self-harming incidents where she repeatedly cut herself, she was transferred to Rampton Secure Hospital. During this time, she displayed even more disturbed behavior. Details of her condition were revealed to the sentencing judge, where it was suggested that she suffered from a mental condition known as Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Well, Munchausen syndrome is, is a syndrome where people look to gain sympathy by causing themselves injury, sometimes fictitious injury. To move that on a stage, Munchausen syndrome by proxy is where one causes injury to somebody else, where you then get sympathy as the carer. 
Beverly Allen was seen to be a good nurse, was seen to be someone who should never be rejected as a nurse because she is, you know, really there for the child. To be seen to be someone who cares deeply about these children, runs around with this child in her arms as some kind of merciful angel that will save this child. And she also, you know, gets the opportunity to be somewhat above some of the other professionals, some of the doctors, because she kind of knows what's going on better than they do, because she caused it. There is, I, I think, a current school of thought that says that there is no such thing, but certainly this was the school of thought at the time that Beverly Allett appeared in 1993. The diagnosis of Munchausen, uh, by proxy, um, has come into disrepute. One of the reasons for that is that the old term, Munchausen by proxy, allowed one to think that everybody knew what you meant, when in fact the people using the term may well have been describing different things. Also, one of the concerns about the diagnosis was when an individual was suspected of various crimes against the victim, perhaps a child, that the emphasis seemed to be more on what was in the mind of the perpetrator rather than clarifying what had happened to the child, the victim. Although much was made of Munchausen syndrome by proxy at the time, this condition had no bearing on the judge's decision. On the 27th of May, 1993, Alec was brought before Justice Latham at Nottingham Crown Court for sentencing. She received 13 concurrent terms of life imprisonment for murder, attempted murder and grievous bodily harm. She was told she would serve a minimum of 30 years. But concerns had been raised as to where that sentence should be served. If she goes to hospital, she's getting what she wants. She ought to be sent to prison and made to stay there. If she wants to kill herself, then let her get on with it. Due to her history of self-harming, the Secretary of State decided that under the Mental Health Act, Alec would serve her time in ramped and secure hospital. It's strange when you see somebody like Alec in the environment of a, a top security hospital. It's not a prison, it is a hospital. She's there to be treated. And what's strange, you know, you, and I think what's been difficult perhaps for, for some of the parents uh, has been the fact that it is quite a soft life. You know, she, she has a TV in her room, um, you know, there are communal areas where she can mix with other people. Rampton Hospital itself has quite regular discos where it's, it's known she has mixed with other patients and has sparked relationships with them. It has a bar. It's a community surrounded by some quite high walls. And, and within that community, it has everything that a, a village life would need. Yes, she can't go wandering off to the shops very often, although she has been uh, under guard, allowed out shopping occasionally in the local area. She's not in any way being punished for, for what she did, and I think that is very difficult for the parents to, to come to terms with. It's not too bad. What's the good thing about it? We're out, got more freedom in it. You like it better than where you were before? Yeah. Why? Because I've got more freedom. I'm not locked up all the time. But when questioned about remorse and motive, there is no response. I don't know, I don't want to talk about it. I'm sorry to say it, but I don't think that rehabilitation is going to be a possibility in her case. I think it's so into her, her system, the whole psychology, the whole culture of what she's done and so on is so much part of her that she's a disturbed young lady and she'll continue to be a disturbed young lady. It was a sign of those times to try and explain psychotic behavior by labeling someone with a fancy medical term, almost to excuse their behavior and then sending them off for rehabilitation. But the fact of the matter is that a murderer is a murderer, serial or otherwise, and no label should detract from the crimes that they have committed. It is, in my judgment, very wrong and misleading for anybody to label Beverly Allard as belonging to either Munchausen syndrome or Munchausen syndrome by proxy because I believe Beverly Allard was cunning, calculating, deceptive, cold-blooded murderer. In December 2007, Beverly Allard appealed against her sentence of 30 years. The judge, however, said he found an element of sadism in her conduct and her offending. 
He also said Alit's crimes had condemned the families of the dead and injured children to a life sentence, from which there is no remission and no release on license. Her appeal was denied and a minimum tariff was fixed at 30 years. If a day ever comes around where some high judge decides that she's going to be released, then we'll be behind everybody else, all the other parents, and saying we'll that we will not allow that to happen. If she ever got out, we would be waiting for her. Even if we was old with sticks, we'd be waiting for her.